Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Exploring Human Resources. My name is Matthew Garcia. I am an Associate Director at the Shavit Glaubeck Center for Career Strategy and Professional Development. I am joined by six amazing industry professionals who are here today to talk to you about human resources from their perspective and their lens. We've prepared some great questions to ask, and we're hoping that the Q&A portion at the end of the session is gonna be very engaging for everybody to get a chance to learn from each of these professionals. So without further ado, to get the most out of the evening, I'd like to start with introductions, but in an atypical kind of way. Uh, and Mitch, just kind of picking randomly, just to start with you and to go on to each panelist, what is a typical work week like in your current role? Sure. So. I'm an HR business partner at KKR, so I cover specific po investing populations at the company and help business leaders manage their teams. So my weeks look really different from, you know, depending on the time of year. So these times, it's mostly involved in recruiting, so I'm helping interview finalist candidates and help putting together offer packages. Um, the same day, I'll be speaking with teams to see how they're operating during this remote environment and whether anybody's really struggling at this time. But towards the end of the year, it's really focused around performance evaluations, deciding how much to compensate our teams, um, who gets promoted, um, and really there's everything else in between. So it's from headcount analyses to talent and diversity initiatives we want to roll out. And then finally, the employee relations matter, mat, employee relations matters that really take up you know, a lot of my time recently. Um, it's sweet. My weeks are never dull. Uh, it keeps me on my toes. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, let's go on with Jory. What's, what is your typical work week like? For sure. Hey guys, I work at Fiverr. It is a freelance company, a freelance service company online. Um, so I'm an HR generalist there. So Mondays are always, always orientation. So I onboard all the new hires, introduce them to their managers, key employees. Um, I would say having orientation, explaining what Fiverr is, who we are, what things we have, what perks and benefits we have. And then I would say the rest of the week is like kind of all over the place. There's always new things going and coming in HR. So it's all over. Um, so I would say right now I'm working on a project um, related to salary, to making sure that men and women are being paid equal. Um, and so I'm working on like a benchmark and seeing what other tech companies are doing. And so make, just making sure that we're not overpaying people or underpaying people. Um, and then I would say working on salary increases, benefits, uh, payroll, calculating overtime for employees. So everything, anything really. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Josh, take it away. What's your typical work week like? Um, hi, I'm Josh Gottesman. I'm the Assistant Director of Human Resources for the Orthodox Union, or OU. Um, my work week is, so all mainly all the HR operations run through me. So my, my work, typical work week is, is a lot of meetings, right? I, I think everyone always has that, a lot of meetings. Um, I like to say they're productive meetings. Um, I, I used to work for, so I, we used to work for an employer who we used to have meetings to schedule the meeting. They were like, call everyone in and say, when are you all available? And it's like, we're all here right now. Let's just meet right now. Like we're all, we could just talk about it. Um, so a lot of meetings, but other than that, in terms of my role and what I do, I spend a lot of time um, on Excel. Excel is a, a wonderful tool for anyone in the HR world and HR field. So a lot of time in Excel, but also obviously what we do is, is our personal connections and relationships with our employees um, and our department directors. So a lot of phone calls, just a lot of face-to-face, -face. Um, not just always a formal meeting when we, you know, we talk about more important stuff or serious stuff, but just getting to know people, seeing how they're doing, checking in. So I would say, you know, my typical work week besides the meeting is going to be on the phone or email, um, just having conversations with people. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. So let's switch on to Yoni. Yoni, why don't you tell us a little bit about what your work week is like in your current role? Well, Josh stole my answer, but I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll piggyback off him. Uh, my name is Yoni <laughs> Lee. I'm the uh, vice president of HR for a company called ACAM. Uh, corporate headquarters in New York, and we have offices uh, here in Florida. So, you know, it's it kind of piggyback what Josh said, a lot of meetings. Um, 
And unfortunately, when you keep moving up the ranks in companies, it, the more higher you get, the more meetings you go to. Um, so my typical week um, really involves kind of overseeing, I see oversee the entire HR department. So my meetings are really with my various department heads talking about different things. So I'll meet the recruiter team, the payroll team, the ER team. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different, you know, parts of HR that we have to oversee. Um, and of course, there's senior leadership meetings every week. So we talk about strategy, um, and we'll probably get into more about that a little bit later. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, discussion about what's the past and what's the future. You know, what have we done? What have we accomplished? What are we doing now? And then what are we going to do next week? And how are we going to keep growing the company? Um, so unfortunately, a lot of times it is on the meetings. And then, you know, you get to a point where, uh, as Josh mentioned, you know, talking to employees is a very important aspect of HR. You got one on one time that, you know, talking to people, you need to know people and building the right culture. Um, and I focus on it every single week, making sure the culture is appropriate for our company, making sure that people know who we are. And um, the biggest compliment we can get in HR is, oh, you're not a typical HR company I thought you would be. That's like the best thing ever. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's our typical week. So thanks, Josh, for stealing my thunder, but uh, well, I'm sure we'll talk more about stuff later. Great way to carry it on over. Thank you. Sarah, why don't you tell us a little bit about your role and what it's like uh, in a typical week? For sure. Thanks, Matt. So I see slowly and slowly more people's cameras are coming on. People are getting a little less shy. So um, love seeing that. I work um, in the talent management team at JetBlue Air Airways. Um, you guys might have heard of it, might have used it to go to Florida because they have a big base um, in New York City and uh, LaGuardia and JFK. Um, and talent management really means something totally different at every company. So the best way I like to explain it is that we make sure the right people are in the right jobs at the right time. So there's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of um, working with like various other uh, departments in the company just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Um, specifically what I do, um, I oversee the internship program, which is currently on hold, um, unfortunately. Um, but a big portion of my work now is managing career development initiatives um, within corporate. So um, my clients or my customers aren't necessarily the people that you'll see working in the airport. Um, there's a separate person on my team who deals with that. But I work for the, you know, the marketing people, the IT people, the finance people, any like corporate function you can imagine, that's who I service. Um, and in terms of a typical work week, I think it really varies. It depends. I also assist with performance management. So if it's the end of the year, the middle of the year, goal setting, I'm helping support that. Um, and that kind of takes up my week. But I would say because of COVID and the time that we're in, um, around 40% of my time is spent on meetings and 60% is working on projects to present at those meetings. Mm -hmm. So 60% is the prep. Um, and like the back end administrative work, and then 40% is like showtime, um, et cetera. Um, I also spend a lot of my time meeting with crew members. Um, that's what we call the employees at JetBlue one-on-one. -on -one, I offer career coaching, resume review, um, or interview prep, but you know, it's so hard to say what a typical work week looks like because there are always like last minute things, as I'm sure um, others could attest to that I just get thrown in or tasks that you just didn't plan for. Got it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Adiv, we're excited to hear from you. Why don't you tell us about your work, typical work week in your current role? Absolutely. So my name is Adiv Zared, and I created A to Z Trading, which is a company I established a little over two years ago. And I help various companies across the country with HR needs, specializing and focusing primarily with recruitment, strategy, talent and performance management, employee relations, change management, and overall coaching. Uh, my week, is, there's no typical week uh, for anyone in HR, especially myself, um, helping various clients, whether it is navigating through COVID protocols. Um, unfortunately, sometimes you have to lay off individuals earlier in the year or even hire individuals. Um, it's handling difficult employee relation issues that may arise at any moment. Uh, and it's handling strategy. You know, I'm always trying to make any business run as efficient and smoothly as possible while streamlining approaches when necessary. So it's really fun. I enjoy doing many different tasks and assignments on a daily and weekly basis. Uh, and 
I believe, like Mitch said earlier, you know, you always are on your toes, which I really enjoy. Got it. Thank you to each and every one of you for answering this, these big questions. And I want to open up the next question to the whole panel and uh, kind of challenge by choice question. So about the field, what, what should students know about HR as a field that they may not learn about in their coursework? Uh, everything. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's funny because, and I, I mean, I don't know if anybody else, I'm sure other people here also taken the SPHR, or the SHR, MCP, you know, courses. And, you know, a lot of those times there's like the book answer and then the real world answer. And, you know, there's so much you can learn from a classroom. Um, you can learn how to, you know, the laws, you know, the EEOC laws, or, you know, what questions can you ask on an interview, or, you know, what are the different, you know, wage and hour our laws. I mean, that's all stuff that you can learn and those things don't change. And, and there's a ton of HR laws that you're going to have to learn. But certain things you can't learn, you know, how to deal with an employee issue, how to deal with an employee who, you know, um, is is attacking somebody else, God forbid, which has happened in my career. You know, an employee is attacking their employee. What do you do? How do you handle the situation? Um, how do you deal with an employee crying in your office? Um, and, and I'll tell you something, you know, and the, the, the best thing you can do in HR is to be as empath empathetic as possible. And in order to do that, you have to experience certain life things of your own, um, you know. And and so the first time I laid off somebody because of a lack of you know business, you know, I probably wasn't doing it the right way. I was 22 years old and didn't think about it much. But you know, many years later, and I've gone through a layoff of my own um, in my career. And then you're doing it. You have more empathy. You're not going to be able to learn in a classroom. You got to understand it and live it and experience it in order to be empathetic and understanding of what the person across from you is going through. Um, so I think the answer is, you know, like, I, I mean, jokingly, the answer is everything, but in all seriousness, there are laws and things you can study, but the human aspect, what we call the human, you know, capital aspect is not something you're going to learn. You have to just experience it and learn from trial by fire. Um, um, I would say, so your employees that you're working with are your clients and you want to satisfy and make your clients and employees happy and work through difficult situations with them. Um, like you said before, you know, we're dealing with emotions, we're dealing with people, we're de dealing with feelings and things are not always cookie cutter. So I would say, I mean, common sense and being on your toes, like for example, if there are two managers who are disagreeing, you have to personally know each of them, you know, and see how they would deal with that situation. Um, also knowing what would be best for each person. Um, that's what I would say, but we have similar answers. <laughs> Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll just speak in. I, I thought it was so interesting during my my HR coursework or studies at YU, you know, you learn kind of the ideal, the theory behind how to have good team management and good, good team structure. And you kind of assume that when everyone goes into the workforce that everyone's going to follow such ideals or people even know about such things. And then you find yourself surrounded by incredibly smart people who struggle with very basic, you know, management behaviors. So it's, how to uh, deliver tough feedback to somebody, how to manage a team of juniors who are also, also very focused on their careers, or how to you know, engage high-performing you know, high talent in your team. These are you know, really complex uh, human behaviors that a lot of people don't have a lot of practice in. And I guess just because it's laid out very nicely in your textbooks or your coursework doesn't mean it's very common in the workforce. Understood, thank you. Yeah, just, just to piggyback off that, I'm um, kind of a combination of what um, everyone is saying, but when I was in undergrad and grad school, and you know, even now, um, I was a huge slash still am a huge nerd when it comes to um, reading the latest HR research um, and articles, figuring out like, okay, what are the best companies doing? Like what are best practices? What are trends to stay um, on top of? And I would think through it and I would say, okay, well, this is the article I read. So practically, how could I incorporate this or how could I apply this to like a real work setting? And there was like what my, one of my favorite articles um, was a project that Google did and they called it Project Aristotle. Um, I know maybe um, a lot of the professionals on here know it as well, or maybe even some of the students have studied it, um, but it was basically all about team effectiveness. And I remember speaking with one of my professors about it and saying like, yeah, you could so easily um, incorporate this stuff. Like the whole premise was you have to build psychological safety and you have to let people be um, 
comfortable bringing them whole, their whole selves to work. And I would say like, this is so easy. You just do X, Y, and Z, just like the article did. And then you achieve psycho, and then you achieve psychological safety and you achieve team effectiveness and it's a win-win. Um, and she said, okay, but what if people don't want to bring them their whole selves to work? What if they like the divide um, between home and life? What if that's what they're comfortable with? What if, what if like that's what they're used to? So I think that a lot of times um, you might learn something in a course or you might read an article and be really interested in it um, like I was. But the important thing that I've learned is that any company that I was at, I took the first couple of months to really examine and study the culture and like all the unspoken rules, like how do they write emails? Are people usually running late or on time, um, et cetera, and really understand the organization as a whole before you start like running guns hot um, with all these interventions. And I, that, that's a problem I think, especially I had early in my career. And I know that a lot of students have, but it, for me, as I progressed in my career, taking that time to really sit back and just learn and absorb everything about the organization before coming in with my own solutions that I thought would work out um, was really essential and helped me be successful. Terrific, thank you. Yeah, I, I would definitely say what everyone else has said, but I think it's the real experience, the real life moments uh, that are not gonna be in the textbooks and what you study in college or uh, graduate school. You know, people, you have to understand that everyone acts differently. Some people understand and learn something one, two, three, while others, it takes a really long time to understand how to learn something and get up to speed. It's the same, some managers and individuals are really good with people and some are really not good. And you really have to be aware of this, treat everyone equally and fairly, but at the same time, make sure that you're treating everyone as a person, as a human being. You know, what Yoni said about having empathy, I think it's really important. You don't know the backgrounds and the story of every employee until you get to know them. And I think the real life experience and exposure you get in a workplace um, is a hundred times greater than anything you'll read in any sort of textbook. Understood, thank you. Josh, you wanna get a final word in? Yeah, yeah, I mean, everyone stole everything I wanted to say, so it's kind of hard here, but I, I will just add, uh, just because the question is, right, what what do you not learn in your courses that, that would be valuable, whether you're starting your career or, or even in your middle of a career or later in career? And I would say, and I always share this with my team to try to try to ground them again. HR is, first of all, it's a huge field and so broad. And all of us on the panel, we all do different things in the field, in the world of HR, even um, to tell you how big it is. But I always try to ground my team in saying, Everyone thinks that they could do HR, right? That's like a notion when you go in, as, when you become an HR professional, you're always going to encounter people who read an article, right? They Harvard Business Review, they read Forbes, um, and they're like, oh, I know what the new buzz thing is. I, I watched a Simon Sinek YouTube video, and now I can give, you know, start with why, and we're going to solve the whole organization's issues. <laughs> and I just, what I think you don't learn in the coursework is the when you approach a situation or you start a job, just keep in mind, people probably suggested what you're about to suggest. So try to do it in a different way than you think maybe people approached it, right? Everyone loves to say, well, oh, let's make a, let's celebrate birthdays. Cause you know, we don't do that at the OU, we don't celebrate birthdays. And there's a reason though behind it because people don't like birthdays or not everyone likes birthdays. Mm -hmm. And we found when, you know, at the Orthodox Union, we have people who are baby boomers, we have people who are millennials, we have people who are Gen Zs. And because of the, the multi um, different, basically different cultures of those generations, it's a conscious decision not to celebrate birthdays. But every couple of years, there's always a new person coming in saying, we need to celebrate birthdays. And it's like, we have to take them in, like there's, there's ageism issues, there's liability issues, we can't give you, you know? So I just say, when you learn in your coursework is really important. Uh, part of your role as an HR professional is taking the theory and applying it to the practice, actually what's happening on your day-to-day -day life and what you do as a work. So try to approach it in a unique way and don't think because your company is not doing it that they've never thought of it before. So I think that's important to keep in mind. HR has been around for a while. Um, and a lot of times, 
companies don't do things just because they don't have the manpower or they don't have the resources or maybe they didn't have an innovative way. So try to take what you're learning and try to think of that, that new way that you can apply it to that specific organization. Understood. Thank you. Appreciate it. So we're going to switch gears a little bit. I have a specific question for each of our panelists, actually beginning with you, Josh. Uh, based on your progression and roles at Orthodox Union, what should our audience know about working for one employer, but in different progressive functions? Yeah, um, I'll give everyone a, a really quick background. Um, to me, I started my career late. Um, I, I wanted to do youth group stuff for so long. I was in YU Smicha. I was going to go to Wurzweiler and, and get a social work degree and, and just do maybe a youth director job. Um, and then I, I, on a whim, I applied for an MBA program um, and I got in and, and it really had a, a kind of a late career change. And I started at the OU as an intern, actually, believe it or not. Um, and now I'm the assistant director of HR there. So I would say I'm, I'm that one intern success story that, that you can hear about. Um, so the way I did it, the way I rose through the ranks um, through my career at the OU is w when I just realized, I, it's a very simple method I did. I, I got really good at my current task and role. And then I tried to think of ways I can add to the team, add value to the company. And it just became a point when when I was first hired as an intern, my one job is to work on job descriptions. And that's all I was doing is rewriting job descriptions. And, and we have about a thousand employees around the country. So it's a lot of job descriptions to, to go through and rewrite. And as I'm going through them, I, you know, I was noticing skills that were missing. So I just went to my, my boss and said, how about I give a training? You know, he goes, you can do trainings. I said, why not? He goes, okay, like, why not give it a shot? And then I did a training and I was good at it. So he's like, oh, like, now you can start doing, you know, professional development stuff. And, I, and that became under my portfolio. And I, and I slowly built it by just, I did the best I can in my current roles. And then I went to him, with, I went to my boss in the organization with ideas of how I can expand it. And with the explanation of how it's connected to what I'm doing and how I can improve it. And then they, they gave me a chance to do it. Um, there were a lot of failures in there. I'm going to be honest, right? Not everything always works out, but I think it's, it's the, it's the, the perseverance and you keep trying and, and it's, it's good to fail. It's good to, it's, it's okay to fail in business. Um, it's not okay to not learn from that failure though, right? You need to learn how to learn what you did wrong and try to make it better. And, and that's what, that's what I would say. I know I'm like an anomaly, especially nowadays, um, normal, you know, a lot of people don't stay in one organization for a long time. You know, that's the newer generation. That's the culture. They call it tours of duty. They'll get their experience and they'll leave. Um, a lot of reasons for that. We don't have to go through that. I don't think we have enough time to go through that whole psychology of it. Um, but, but I love where I work. I love what I do. I love the profession of, a, of HR. And, and I think to build, if you want to build your career, um, become really good at your, your current role, even if it's maybe not something you always dreamed of. And then don't be afraid to take a chance. Don't be afraid to speak up for yourself and say, hey, give me a chance and let me do this. Now, maybe it's HR analytics that you want to get into. Maybe it's employee relations. Maybe it's recruiting. Um, don't be afraid to do that. And that's how you could build up, especially in the one, in the one, in your one organization, because if you're in that organization, you can sometimes identify what's needed in the organization. Um, so don't be afraid. And I will just say my, my last thing, if you go to your supervisor, your boss, your manager and say, Hey, I have this idea. Here's the whole plan, right? Don't just come with a buzzword that you heard, but actually have a plan of how you want to accomplish it. And that supervisor or manager tells you no, then I think that tells you about the place that you're not going to probably be working there for so long, right? If they're not looking for that type of, 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 of fight and that type of, of a worker and employee, then I don't know if you're going to want to be there. So don't be afraid to take chances, um, but, but try to identify really what the organization could, could, could value in terms of the new programs that you want to bring to it. Awesome. Thank you. Jory, what were some of the formative experiences in your career that have made you successful in your role as a human resources generalist? Awesome, thank you. Well, as a generalist, I do, I would say, payroll, benefits, employee relations, everything, like really in HR combined into one role, um, but little bits of everything. Um, so I would say my, like what, what helped me was studying finance at YU. So either I would say something within math or statistics 
or finance really helped me um, with payroll because payroll is very complex. Um, and I have to do salary increases, bonuses, um, I don't know, just organizing things on Excel documents. I think finance really helped me with that. Um, and I would say, this is kind of a basic answer, but going to career fairs, networking events, even Jewish dating events, honestly, you know, going up to a guy and being forward, um, but really just being comfortable and capable to speak um, to anyone on any topic. And those events really helped me just come up with questions to ask employees when I'm talking to them on, the, on my one-on-ones or just in general. So just being comfortable to speak with people and being a good listener really helped me with that. And I would say just like a side note uh, about HR, you're kind of like a, a psychologist. So really just being able, you know, to ask those questions and listen from career fairs and networking events really helped me. Um, so I hope they'll help you guys too. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yoni, during your career, what is one major tenet about the field that has changed through your progression? And what is one major tenet that has stayed the same? So the, the truth is, I'm going to age myself a little bit here. Um, the, the thing that stayed the same is, is you know, there are certain aspects of HR that haven't changed. And I think Jory referred to them, you know, benefits, payroll, you know, that's going to be HR no matter what company you work for and no matter how long it's going to be. Um, that's always going to be part of HR. And that's important. And trust me, people getting paid is important. And they, they'll love you for it. Um, and, you know, when I first started in HR, um, and I'm going to give a shout out to Lenny Bessler, who kind of got me into this career um, in a very roundabout way. Um, you know, he, it, it was very much still, a lot of companies were still very much focused on, you know, HR was that principal's office. Right. Um, and you probably saw a lot of, you know, movies and, and social media and, you know, uh, even like, you know, Big Bang Theory, they always make fun of the HR people. Right. Because it's that principal's office that, you know, place you go to where it's bad news and big, scary HR and all that stuff. And that, you know, I think it's changed, but it's still part of the job. I think the part that's really changed in the past, and I hate to say this, 25 years since I've been doing this job, um, HR has become really a strategic partner to companies. And that's what, you know, we've, we've turned into. We've went away from this, you know, back office operation where we're doing benefits by hand because a lot of that stuff's automated now. And HR has kind of changed from that to becoming a strategic partner. You know, my, my boss, the president of the company, you know, it's, he relies on me to bring up how we're going to strategize in the company and not just sit there and say, okay, what kind of benefits are we going to offer next year in open enrollment? It's what can the company do as a strategy that's going to actually have the human capital aspect, create the company be better, stronger, more efficient, and move to the next direction. And for a long time, a lot of companies didn't want that for HR. They just put HR in the corner and that was like, okay, guys, there's your benefits, there's your payroll, and don't talk to them. Um, and over the past long time, um, that has changed to become HR, become a more strategic partner. And that's, you know, and Josh mentioned earlier, that's what I love about this career. I mean, you, you know, you're able to go in and say, hey, look, this is how it's going to help the company, you know, because look, HR costs money, right? Benefits cost money, payroll costs money, raises cost money, and, and companies want to know what you're going to do to help them. And when you come and say, hey, I can strategize and come up with a way where it's going to be more efficient and better and help the company grow, and they see that return the investment, it helps the company, you know, move in the right direction. And, and that's what HR has become more recently, and I love it. It's so more strategy, more in involvement in the business aspect. And uh, I think it's, it's incredible. Terrific. Thank you, Yomi. I really appreciate it. Mitch, how has involvement and membership in professional organizations supported your career development and networking opportunities? So I'd say I was definitely much more involved in uh, SHRM, Society of Human Resource Management, at the earlier stages of my career. And it's definitely gotten less so in recent past couple of years, but I think my network has helped kind of fill that gap there. So in the earlier stages, I was very involved there. I would try to go to events. I would, you know, scour the website for a lot of really good resources on this website. I mean, it's a, it, there's so much good content there and best practices to learn from. And so I, I definitely learned a lot about HR disciplines on the site. Um, I then was very, I guess, strategic in how I reached out to people on LinkedIn to get to know more about the field. I kind of look for people who are involved in SHRM. Usually that's it kind of indicates what kind of person they are, um, that they're, if they're willing to kind of enter this organization, they're willing to, you know, respond to a, a young person in, uh, in NYU to see if it's like, have a couple of minutes to talk about the, about their career. And so I definitely used it to, as a stepping stone to reach out to a number of people across 
you know, you know the HR disciplines to, to familiarize myself and what I ultimately wanted to go into. Um, and actually, it helped me lead into my first job as an intern at a restaurant company that was not kosher, but it was really it was a good experience. Uh, and uh, that was kind of a stepping stone for me in my career. So I'd say it's it's definitely critical in the earlier parts of your career to be as open about these networks, about these uh, organizations, because you never know what a one-off conversation will lead to. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sarah, what was the most impactful result that your master's degree in IO Psych had on your skills, experiences, and success in your career? So I'm going to cheat a little bit and have and say two things. Um, and just because Mitch just went and said that he was an intern for a non-kosher restaurant, um, I want to chime in and, and say that it's related because the, the thing that really impacted me, um, one of the things that really impacted me, me the most during my master's in industrial psychology was my cohort. So basically my grade, who I was going through classes with, et cetera. Um, that cohort led to a lot of great and valuable networking. That was actually um, the way I got many of my jobs is we would all look out for each other and we would say, oh, I know you're interested in this. Um, here's the job description, let me know. Or even now when we're, when someone's working at a company, they reach out um, to someone else in the cohort to say, oh, I saw this opening. Um, tell me like what's the culture like, what's the company um, striving to do? How do they view HR, et cetera. Um, besides for the networking and that, kind of career assistance that we all help each other with now. While we were in school, um, while we were taking classes, it was night classes, we were all working and we were all working full time and taking classes from six to nine. Um, so we kind of had to really stick together and we would have study sessions, we were able to bounce ideas off each other. Um, and again, those relationships are still strong till this day. Um, and then the second thing that might be a bit surprising um, is actually the courses that I didn't like and that I didn't enjoy as much. Um, I found these to be super helpful because I walked into um, my master's program with like huge eyes, um, loving everything and everything about industrial psychology. I was like, I just want to do it all. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want a job where I can do everything. Um, but taking some of these classes really helped me clarify what I didn't want to do. And it helped me enjoy the classes that I was interested in and created like a really good contrast so I could see like what my career path would look like moving forward. Excellent, thank you very much. Adiv, when, when you had navigated your job searches, what specific strategies made you most successful? And when it did get challenging, how did you respond? Yeah, great question. So I would say just to give everyone a little backstory of myself. I've worked in HR for a variety of different industries from a finance and accounting company to Nestle, United Airlines, a startup technology company, and a five-star hotel to name a few. So I've worked in all different industries while always trying to move up the chain in more responsibilities, title, etc. cetera. Uh, I would say that a few, there's a few items. One is networking. I think it's really crucial, especially while everyone we're speaking to is in college or undergrad, uh, it's very important to network, go on LinkedIn, connect with other HR professionals uh, in various industries because you never know when that connection could maybe be very beneficial for you. And worst case scenario, you're connected with them, you could bounce ideas off of them and they could be another resource for you. I think it's also imperative that everyone understands the use of using job boards. I think whether it is LinkedIn, Indeed, Glassdoor, and many others, uh, there's really a lot of valuable resources that can be extremely helpful to individuals looking for their next move. And I think there's more efficient ways to use it and then less efficient ways of using it. And it's very important to get familiar with all these different systems so that when you are looking for the next opportunity, then everything is easier for you. How I looked at getting new opportunities was a few items. I wanted to always take on more responsibilities and I wanted to also work for one of the top companies within a, a respective industry that I was looking into. And every week or so I wrote down 
about the top five companies for various industries. And every week or two, I reviewed their actual website to see if there were any careers within HR jobs that I was looking for. So that's, that's how I went about it. Um, it was really that and networking and being persistent um, and not giving up. At the end of the day, uh, to your second question about the challenges, I think the biggest challenge really would be all the positions that I was trying to get uh, were very challenging. I think that any position that most company puts out there, there's, they're generally only filling one position of that specific HR role and function. And the amount of applicants that any position receives, whether it's HR or not, are well north of 100 individual, individuals. So that means that you have about 1% chance of landing the opportunity. And that's after a few rounds of interviews. So it could be a little discouraging. You're definitely not gonna hit on all of them the first time around. And that's why you have to be persistent. And I think it's a numbers game. The, the same way it could be for dating or any other thing. I think the more people you see, um, you know, you're, you're bound to make a connection long-term. So. I think it's being persistent. I think it's networking. I think it's knowing how to use the different job boards out there. And finally, it's being persistent. Excellent, thank you very much. I have one more question for the panel, but before we do get to that final question, just wanted to let the audience know that if you are thinking of some, some questions for Q&A, please add them into the chat. You can message me directly in the chat with that question. I'll be asking those questions on your behalf or giving you the floor to do so in the next couple of minutes. Uh, for the panel, final question and it has to do with entering the HR world. Uh, what is one goal our audience should accomplish in the next year with the information that they learned from you all today? I can, uh, I can go. Uh, look, it's a, it's a big HR world out there, as you can see from all the different panelists here. Um, you know, there's recruiting, there's benefits, there's payroll, there's HR consulting, there's HR business partners, there's plenty of avenues to go down. Um, so I would encourage you over the next year to learn what's out there, learn what you're interested in. Um, you know, what's I think so interesting about HR is that you can work pretty much at any company. I think a D has worked at every industry so far. So you can work wherever you want. Um, it's finding the right HR role for yourself. And I think between knowing what's out there and knowing what you're interested in, you can help steer yourself into a role that you ultimately want to be in. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I would say virtual networking events, if that's possible, um, just to meet more people, because right now it's kind of hard to meet people. Um, so I'd say virtual networking events, as well as Something that I usually tell people if they're looking for a job as we're at a specific company is to find the HR. I mean, this is comes back on us, but find the HR generalist, the HR, you know, associate, HR manager, and then reach out to them maybe on LinkedIn and see if you could have a conversation with them to learn more about that, obviously, you know, virtually as well. Um, and then this one kind of just like falls back on me. I do not think I learned just in general enough Excel um, in my life. So Excel, I would say learn Excel in college um, because I wish I had better experience. And my boss always asks me to create pivot tables and it takes me so long. So I feel like if I had better experience within Excel, I would, yeah, things would be better. But so those are a few of my tips for you. Thank you. Um, just to piggyback on what Jory said, I think, you know, finding a mentor is good it is the right way to also go things um I, I think every person should have a mentor in life work wise i think it's important you know i have an hr mentor who i speak to um you know again somebody who i worked with many years ago who is no, long retired but i still reach out to him for advice and ask questions and i think you know now's a good time um to reach out kind of piggyback with you said of finding the hr generalist or manager that you can talk to or, or whoever it is um, and then find somebody you could get a mentor and become a mentee, just learn and hear from them. And, you know, like I said, every experience is different and they may not have all the answers, but having somebody to go to and, and talk to. Um, and again, I, I like to think I have a lot of experience, but I hit roadblocks and I hit things that I don't know what to do. And, you know, having somebody from an outside perspective who is not in my company, who can speak freely to me and say things um, is a great thing. So that'd be my advice. Awesome. Yeah. Just to um, just to highlight that, 
with a mentor, I think that it's really important to, to yes, like find that person, network, find like who's the right fit for you. Um, I spoke to a ton of different people and not every person was like mentor material, meaning like they didn't work in the area that I wanted or I just felt like like it just wasn't a good match, et cetera. It is, I know we keep on like going back to like, it's like dating, it's whatever, but it really does take time, A, to find the right job and B, to find the right mentor. Um, so speak to a lot of people. And also um, what someone told me and what I always tell people who are applying for jobs is don't only reach out to people when you need them um, because that, um, you know, that is very like transparent and people can spot that a mile away, but also check in occasionally, maybe share an article that you thought was interesting that's related to their work. Um, and my second piece of advice is if you haven't already done so, I'm not sure, you know, what level everyone's in, if they're like freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, et cetera. But if you haven't already done so, take a management or HR course um, or both. I was able to take um, both while I was at Stern, even though I majored in psychology, I kind of concentrated um, in management and that really helped um, just that that really helped and made more sense when I was applying to HR internships. And that brings me to like my last piece of advice is really try your hardest. And I this was without a doubt to be totally transparent. One of the biggest roadblocks of my career um, was getting my foot in the door and getting that first internship because it's really tough and I'm seeing like some head nods so maybe other people are experiencing this um but like any internships research opportunities shadowing volunteering anything that you know gets you in the door it doesn't need to be a paid internship but anything that just gives you some exposure and some more knowledge to the field is great um and I know that Josh, you mentioned that you were an intern and you're now the associate director. Um, so I, I always tell the interns at JetBlue because I run orientation and I do professional development courses for them that they can be the next directors of the company with the right training. And that's not something, that's not a high achieving goal because um, that's not, 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 sorry, not, not that it's not high achieving, it is, but that's not, unrealistic because there are many of our directors and managers who once started as interns. Um, so it is nice to like grow within a company. And if you don't get an internship, that's okay. Because I myself got rejected three times for the internship at JetBlue. And now I run the program and my manager is the one who rejected me all three times. And I remind her about it like at least once a month now, once every other month. And she tells me like, it's enough, but it's a joke <laughs> that we have. Um, and just never give up. Again, like so much what Adib said, be persistent. Um, any any rejection that you get, um, ask for feedback. Say, thank you so much for letting me know. What can I do to be better? And then keep up with them. That rejection is now your, part of your new network. And that's how you really have to approach it as an opportunity. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate it. Josh, are you going? Or? <laughs> <laughs> you can go, you can go. I'll go, but, but I think uh, just like everyone touched upon, uh, it's a few items. It's networking, you know, connect with individuals, whether LinkedIn or other avenues. I think uh, it's very important to try to get an internship if you can. Uh, I think everyone in college has to realize, listen, you're starting from the beginning and any experience is the blueprint to an entire career per se. So, you know, don't worry about taking on the world, taking on a million different responsibilities. Uh, get your foot in the door, learn a few items, see what you love, see what you don't love. Um, and then you'll have a better scope and idea of really how you wanna pave your career. And I think finally, it's having a mentor, you know, whether it's someone who's seasoned in HR or someone who's in their first role of a company, you know, it's really important to get their perspective, understand what it takes to be an HR professional and successful in whatever different industry or field that they're in. So I think those few items will be essential uh, for anyone's success within HR. Awesome. Yeah, I just wanna reiterate, and Jory, you said it, Excel is so important. Um, I cannot tell you, I happen to be an Excel nerd, so I know that I'm not the normal person, I could sit in front of an Excel spreadsheet for hours, literally, sometimes I have to do for six hours, and, and that's fun to me. 
Um, I know, I know I'm not normal, that's fine. Um, but Excel is so important. And, and I'll tell you, like when we do comp, oh, I'm in charge of compensation, we do comp, it's, it's all analysis, right? It's all analysis. what did they get last year? What percentage was it? How much would this percent be? And if you can't sit in that meeting with the executive vice president, with the chief financial officer and give answers quickly, then you, you got to learn those skills to be able to get to that seat, right? That's what you got to start Excel now to do it. Um, I know you mentioned pivot tables. I'm gonna, pivot tables are key. Also V lookup, okay? If, those are the two things that you need and you will be successful in HR, I promise you. V lookup and pivot tables. I happen to be the trainer at the OU. I give trainings all the time. Give a training last week, last week in Beginner's Excel. I'm doing one in two weeks on, on Advanced Excel. It, it is so important in the field that we do. The end of the day, no matter what HR program you have that's fancy, that has a dashboard, that could tell you the turnover rate, you're going to have to do Excel work, okay? It doesn't matter what they use. Um, you will eventually need to do Excel work. And the other thing I just want to say, because I know it was said already, there's definitely a catch-22 in the HR world where you can't get hired without experience, but you can't get experience because you're not getting hired, right? Um, so... I know I, I took this approach. It doesn't work for everyone, and I get it. Um, it doesn't work for every company. But as I said, I started my career late. I, I didn't have any HR experience. But when I started learning about what HR was, I realized my past experience actually had a lot of HR management theories in it and HR practice in it. So just because you don't have a, a purely HR internship, as an example, that doesn't mean you're not doing HR-related stuff. So don't be afraid to spin it on your resume and in the interview. No, I was doing HR stuff. And also don't be afraid if you get an internship that's not purely HR to ask them to do HR. I've had that before. Like, hey, I'm interning here. Could I, could I help you with your um, performance reviews? I would love to take a stab at it. You know, I'm getting my degree in it. And you'd be surprised that companies are, are just looking for help anywhere they can. And they might, you know, they might be willing to let you do it. Um, so, you know, yes, you, you got to keep going and, and don't be discouraged if you don't get a purely HR internship because there's still HR experience you can get, even if it's not an HR company or an HR role. Awesome. Thanks so much. Well, I wanted to say I appreciate each and every one of you very much for answering my questions. I've gotten a few questions from the audience, uh, one of which is similar to another student. So I'm going to ask them at the same time. Number one, is it important to have a master's degree for an HR career, short-term or long-term? And um, if so, what are some typical graduate pathways that they can follow in order to navigate getting that master's degree? So I, I, I don't know if someone's gonna respond to this. I mean, the answer is yes. Um, unfortunately, if you wanna, if you're making HR your career and you wanna get to the level, Again, not, this sounds egotistical, so I apologize, but I would have not gotten this position as a VP had I not had my master's and my SPHR and my SHR SMP. It just wouldn't happen, right? If you wanna run the HR department um, in bigger companies, um, you know, Fortune 500 companies or companies that are gonna go public, they wanna see the degrees behind it. Um, it's just a fact. Now, the one thing I regret is that I did my master's later um, when I was a little bit older and I did it at night, kind of like what Sarah did and I did it online. And it took me a long time and a lot of sleepless nights um, to do it um, because the expectations were high and then I had to do it because I wanted to get to this level I am now. So, you know, you do need it. Now the question comes down to what's better, a master's or one of those, you know, a SHRM certification or the HRCI certification, you know, it depends how far you want to go. Um, I think they're all important. And I think that's something that you can just keep doing progressively in life. But I do think having a master's is if your ultimate goal is to run the department and be the end all HR, you know, chief, or they call them CHROs, or, you know, in this case, the VP position, you need it. It's just the reality. And that's not just for HR. I think that's any business position you are in. If you want to get to the ultimate position, you need a, an MA or an MBA to get there. Um, that's my two cents. Understood. Anyone you can all disagree with me if you want. I don't know. Nobody else is speaking. No, so. I, I would say <laughs> I totally agree. And just uh, uh, they make programs designed if you work full time. Is, is it the longest day of, of, yes, it's a really long day. I did it too, right? I, I started my commute at 7.30 in the morning, didn't get home till after nine o'clock. But it's worth it, right? You have to put the grind in, you get it done. And they make programs designed. And there's plenty of people who, who start their career right? Because you don't need it for the entry-level positions in HR. 
And then they get it a couple of years in. Some programs won't even accept you unless you have experience. So um, it, it, it's okay to, it's okay to, you don't have to get it right away, even though some people do. Um, I also find, I, I mean, I found a lot of people like to get the masters in IO um, and then switch into HR functions. Um, you know, and, and I would also say it's important. You, you should also know the differences of IO and HR, even though they overlap a lot. Um, but that's just when you're interviewing and, and looking for jobs to know the different roles and, and it all works. So is it, is it scary and daunting? Yes. Is it doable? Absolutely. Got it. Thank you. Uh, on that, I would say it's probably advised to get some sort of degree, whether it's PHR, SPHR or master's. Uh, but I myself do not have one. Uh, I've been dabbling with the fact going for a PHR, SPHR, SPHR. but uh, you can definitely move up the ladder without one. I think that it really depends on the company and industry. I think a lot of Fortune 500 companies will require um, you to get some, but I really do think at the end of the day, let's say you're working for a Nestle and you're moving up the chain slowly and slowly. At the end of the day, if you've been with the company for 10 years and doing a hell of a good job, and there's someone and they're looking for a CHRO or top person in HR, you'll have probably a better opportunity to get that than someone else. And worst case scenario, they'll say, hey, we really want you to at least get a master's if you get this opportunity. So I don't think it's done you're, you're finished without one, but I definitely do feel you do have an upper edge, uh, especially if you're coming from an external way. Uh, so that's my two cents. A, a trend that I also saw just to like, just to bounce off that is that a lot of times as you go up the ladder in um, your organization, you might notice that the people who are a little bit more senior do not have any um, HR schooling at all. Um, and, you know, they have a similar um, to what Josh said, they have, they've identified transferable skill sets that make them successful in their current roles. So it's not really a lacking, but I think it could kind of be misleading because you're like, oh, I, they didn't go to, they didn't get their master's. They didn't even major in psychology. They majored in finance and here they are, VP of talent and learning. Um, my personal senior vice president of talent and learning um, has her degree in marketing and she's worked in marketing for most of her career and only made the switch to HR about five years ago. Um, so I think it could be tempting to kind of look at that and say, well, they don't have it, so I don't need it. Um, but I think that you'll see one of the more recent trends is that it is becoming um, a preferable qualification and how I always read a job description. So just some practical advice when you're reading a job description, they'll usually have like the minimum qualifications and the preferred qualifications. You wanna make sure that you're hitting as many of those preferred as possible. Yes, they're niceties, but they're, they're what's gonna um, distinguish you from the other candidates. Excellent, thank you all for sharing. If there's any other points to add, please feel free. Otherwise, I can get to the next question. Josh, you might like this one. This next question is about Excel. Uh, the, our student asked, uh, because they take intro to info systems, they're getting a depth of knowledge for Excel, uh, but they feel that they may not be getting as many real life examples to apply such a depth of, of understanding. And so how can our students teach themselves about where the real world applications are of what they're learning in the course and what they can teach themselves thereafter. Josh, I think you was asking you specifically, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, okay, I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I, I would say there's two, there's two different types of, at least I can formulate, there's two different types of Excel work that we do. There's one that, that I call just cleaning up lists right? They need a list of every new hire since January 1st with a de department, sub-department supervisor. So you run it and you think it's a click of a button, but unfortunately that doesn't always happen. Um, sometimes data is not accurate. Um, let's say they want to add in how much they get paid. Let's say they want to add a different field. So that's one type of work that you do in Excel, right? You're going to export lists from two different databases. Um, hopefully they have a unique identifier on each, on each piece and you're going to combine them. 
That's the one type. You're just preparing lists, and that's a lot of times what they want. Um, you keep in mind, right? The, keep in mind, you're not just giving them a list, right? You want, you need to make it look nice. You need the formatting of Excel. And if you're presenting it to people, how does it look? The other type is the HR analytics, which are, which are the fun part of the Excel that you can do. Um, it, it could be turnover rate, right? You want to know your turnover rate. I, I could tell you a piece of, of da a data that we just ran. We wanted to see what our performance review trends were over the past five, six years. Okay. So we literally had to export six years worth of performance reviews and start finding um, what's the trends? What's the average grade that people get? Um, does a poor performance review have any correlation to termination? Does a, a good performance review mean someone's staying in the company longer? So that, that's some of the real world applications that you can bring to a company if you know Excel and how to set it up um, that can really be valuable because then they could start pinpointing their programs to identify um, we just ran it. We we could see that one to two years, right, is basically the same type of turnover rate and same type of retention. It's really between the two and three years that we need to start targeting. So there's people that are coming up on the two-year anniversary. What programs are you doing to get them excited and re-engaged in what they're doing? So that's the type of Excel work that you're going to run because all you're going to have is, is a list of people and start dates. And then you need to start using the analytic mind of yours to how can I make this data useful? Awesome. Can I just piggyback on that? Um, you know, the, the biggest thing I use Excel for at, at this point is budgets. Um, and that's that's a real world application. I mean, we're I'm looking at budgets all the time, whether it's, you know, department budgets, salary budgets, and, and again, even internal HR budgets, you know, how much are we spending recruitment, how much are we spending on employee welfare, um, how much spending on benefits, etc. So, you know, if you can understand the basics of how to create a budget, how to analyze a budget, how to project a, bru a budget, um, and then, you know, not only projecting the budget, but the real world, like what happened with the budget? Did he hit the numbers, where the numbers are at? Um, and you can play with your own budget. I mean, Excel has a lot of different possibilities for this. Um, in fact, I convinced my kid who just got married to use budget for his own household items. And he thought it was crazy, but then two months into it, he's like, wow, this actually works. So, um, you know, budgets are a big part, part of it. That's that's a big part of HR because, you know, we're always, they're always gonna be looking at you to say, hey, what's the budget? What's gonna cost? What's, what's the formula? Um, so I think that's something else also real world application. Awesome, thank you. For what it's worth, my, um, my first dabble into Excel was in that intro to information systems. It kind of like sparked just a curiosity. I think the Excel community online is a really supportive one. And if you're ever coming across a issue or how to do X, Y, and Z, I can guarantee you there's some resource online that has it. Um, I definitely didn't learn everything I needed to know coming out of my intro to information systems class, but you know, just Googling and looking online at different problems, it really helps you understand what type of trends you're seeing in the workforce. Excel has been, you know, a great tool and has helped you know, me, make, made me look smarter than I actually am with the information that I had available to me. Uh, I, I think Google and YouTube videos are key, uh, especially for anyone who wants to dabble and learn Excel. Uh, also, there's a variety of different Excel programs and softwares and trainings out there that you could get for under $50 that is really beneficial. It comes in CDs or just online and you have forever to always go back to. So I definitely advise spending a little money and learning that, especially when you have time right now prior to joining the workforce. Awesome, everyone, thank you. So that about wraps it up for the questions that we had from our audience. I wanted to say I really appreciate each of you for making the time tonight to speak to our students. I'm sure that they've gained a lot uh, and that they will gain a lot upon viewing this on our YouTube page. So it's been terrific to have the conversation with you all. Uh, my final question would be, how is it that students might be able to reach out to you, maybe follow up on these kinds of conversations? Any preferences among you all? Yeah, I, I think uh, anyone feel free to contact, connect, with me on LinkedIn, that's probably the best source. And um, I'll try to be very prompt uh, with getting back to anyone. Me too. Yeah, yeah. LinkedIn. LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the tool. <laughs>
I, I'm going to say my office is down the street from Stern, if that helps you guys. I'm on 38th and Madison. So if you want to walk by and say hi, you're more than welcome to that too. <laughs> there you go. It's in the neighborhood. Awesome. Well, if you do need support students in, in reaching out to these professionals because you've never done so before, or you have, but you just want to make a good impression, please make an appointment with a career advisor at the Shave and Glaubeck Center, and we'd be happy to support you. Otherwise, thank you all for coming. Professionals, again, a big thank you from me and from the Shave and Glaubeck Center. Everyone have a great evening and take care. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.